Father, thank you for drawing us to your house of worship today, Lord, for allowing us to be in a country where we can open your word without fear, Lord, and uh, be able to study it and allow your Holy Spirit to help us hear the truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, you're here for the culmination, the final of four weeks of our sermon called True North. And if this is your first week or you missed a couple, let me just quickly catch you up so you can feel like, hey, I got this. I know what's going on, right? So the, the Lord had moved us in such a way we said, you know what? There are a lot of teachings out there in our society right now that are not the truth, right? People, it's, it's popular opinion. I'm going to say that's it. It could change in 10 years because popular opinion changes, right? What is the truth? So we focused on four main topics. The first one was this. Is there an absolute truth? Do I, can I find a truth out there? And we said, yes, that's God's word, right? God's word is the truth. And uh, you can actually find that. It doesn't change. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The second week, uh, Pastor Jet preached on, uh, is there a way to heaven besides Jesus, right? And John 14 says, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me, right? So we wanted to share that truth that Jesus is the way to the Father and thank the Lord that he is. Last week, John gave a message on good enough, right? Many people think, well, I'm good enough to get to heaven. And that's very scary, right? Because we never know if we've done enough because we haven't. Jesus is the one who is good enough to get us through faith in him, right? We believe that Jesus paid for all on the cross, that he renews us, and he is the one that has given us that bridge to the Father, right? So that's kind of a synopsis. So today, where do we go? Today, we're going to talk about sexuality, right? And some of you are like, oh my goodness, I can't believe I didn't get an email that uh, fifth grade on below should not be here. Trust me, you're going to be fine. Uh, I'm keeping this G, and I'm actually going to be talking about something different than you probably thought about, and here's the problem. If they're in first grade, second grade, third grade, they're hearing it. They need to be here about this topic, right? So we're going to talk about the first topic that you thought I was going to talk about. <laughs> it's the traditional topic that when we bring up this S word and we, we have it in a sermon, it's basically, what does the Bible say about uh, when we should uh, have that union physically? And what does it look like? I'm going to be real clear and simple and biblical for you. We believe, and what the Bible teaches is that, that coming together physically, right, in that way, is reserved in God's eyes and God's design, for a man and a woman in heterosexual marriage. Okay? That's, that's what the Bible teaches. And so we're not really going to focus on that today. We're going to put that on the shelf, and we can have a Bible study topic on that if you want to talk about that as well, and uh, if there's you know, any caveats there. What we're going to focus today is on gender identity. Gender identity. And I don't think there's many of you out there who are clueless on this, Right? You're like, yeah, I'm seeing this all over. The LBGT movement. Um, am I a man? Am I a girl? Am I a woman? You know, who knows? Right? Am I, uh, I know I was born as a, a boy, but do I feel like a boy now? Right? And what do I do about that? Can I get a surgery to have things change? Right? And if you're thinking, man, uh, this just is out there and it's not really close to me, you're wrong. I cannot tell you. Um, I don't like saying you're wrong, but I just want to try to convince you, right, to listen for the next 20 minutes and see how important this is for every single one of you. So I'm going to start in Canada. I'll make my way to Dallas-Fort Worth, right? So six months, seven months ago, the Supreme Court of British Columbia, right, it's the territory in the furthest west there in Canada, uh, the British Columbia Supreme Court had a hearing of two parents with a 14-year-old son. And this son wanted to start taking uh, hormones to change his identity to be a girl. And he was being fought on this by his parents. They're like, no, we don't think this is wise for you to do right now. Well, the court ruled that the parents uh, did not have a say in it. The 14-year-old could start the treatments, uh, ending in actually a surgery when the years, when it progressed. And that if these parents in any way reflected to this boy his pronouns of his birth, such as him, he, or what have you, they would be in contempt and they would actually be held liable for harassment to their son, now daughter. Okay? I'm not making this up. But that's Canada. We know it's like close to Washington, Oregon, and California, but uh, <laughs> it is geographically, I'm just saying, right? Uh, that's Canada. Well, it gets closer, right? You look in the States. 
A lot of things are happening in California, New York, but I just want to share with you the New York Times. You can Google this right on top. Just put New York, New York Times uh, gender uh, pronouns on there, okay? So they have articles and their stuff where they're trying to be politically correct. Instead of using he or she, they use they or their, right? And so it's really hard to read. I'm trying to figure out who are they talking about because they are there. Webster's Dictionary is, is wrestling with the idea to make this proper as well, Right? In fact, you might have missed it. October 16th was Personal Pronoun Preference Day. <laughs> I'm serious. October 16th, they celebrate Personal Pronoun Preference Day, right? And then you get in to Texas. And right here in our own backyard in Dallas, uh, this, is, this is nothing new to you. Look at this picture right here. This little guy, his dad's Jeffrey Younger. His, his, his son's name is James. And James, okay, James... Uh, is a twin, seven-year-old twin. And so mom and dad were fighting for custody. Who's going to get primary custody? And the reason is, is the mom thinks that not both of the boys, but James, uh, wants to get a gender identity change. And she wants to start him on hormone treatments at the age of seven. So the beginning of this week, a jury, 11 to 1, sided with the mom. Dad gets no rights. Treatments can start beginning. Fortunately, on Thursday, a judge in Dallas said, no, um, I, I think the jury's wrong. We're going to have to, we're going to give 50-50 custody to these parents, and they have to agree on any medical procedures from here on forward, right? Now, why do I pause and end with this illustration to bring it home is this. Did, did you catch the jury's decision? The jury's over 18. These are adults. It's not like, okay, just all, everybody under 20 thinks this way. No, that's not true. Adults, 11 to 1 here in Texas. This is something that we need to wrestle with, that the church needs to wrestle with. But here's the important thing to remember, and I want you to hear this clearly. We have to deal with this issue with firmness and love. Firmness and love. We can't waffle on it. We can't say, well, maybe God's word doesn't mean that. That would not be firm. But we also have to do this with love in a way that how do we develop relationships with people who are struggling? Because that's what they are. They are struggling. I've talked to some where they're hurting inside. And maybe you have too. They're hurting. They're wrestling psychologically with this, right? There's very few that think, well, this is a popular thing to do. I'm going to do it. Mainly, they are wrestling and hurting inside. Here's the good opportunity we have. Ten years ago, even ten years ago, we wouldn't even think this is a topic, right? but it is. And I am thankful that it's out in the open right now. Because if people are feeling this and they couldn't share, how would we know? But now that they are, you have an opportunity for dialogue, for friendship, for connection, to love people through some of this hardest parts of their life, no matter what age they are. I'm going to say one more thing, and I'm going to jump into our outline. If you ask anybody that's under 40, what is the church against and what it's for? They will have many more answers on what the church is opposed to as opposed to what the church is for. And most of the answers on what the church is for will be wrong. We got a lot of work to do, right? So that's why I'm going to take an hour and a half. <laughs> All right. So to your outlines here, as we, we, we run through this, I... I I'm happy to tell you that God actually has something to say about this topic, okay? Here's the question you need to wrestle with first. Is the Bible authoritative? This is your primary question right here because if you don't get this question right or the answer to it, then you're going to be really confused on how to answer these things because what you will do is you will find what your authority is and it, and it won't be from God. It will be popular opinion, it will be what your friends think. It might be what you think feels good to you. Like, I don't want to offend anybody. This feels good to say this as opposed to that. But you got to wrestle with this one question. Do I believe that the Bible is authoritative? Meaning, do I believe that, that the Bible is God's word and it has a guide that is true for my life? Here's a scripture that helps us with that. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Paul, an early missionary, missionary, writes to young Timothy, who's a pastor out in the field. He says this, all scripture is God-breathed, is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, 
so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Notice what that does say and doesn't say. It doesn't say some. It says all Scripture is God-breathed. It doesn't say it is man-breathed. Man didn't make this up. God actually worked through people who wrote Scripture. It is God-breathed. His Spirit guided them, right? There are a lot of people in this country right now, even Christians, church bodies, that will take God's Word, and you know what they'll do? They'll look at part of Paul's writings, whether it's Galatians, Ephesians, Romans, Colossians, Philippians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, whatever it is. They'll say, you know what? There are some things that Paul wrote that I don't agree with. And what do you think they do? Here's the easy out. They say, you know, I think that was just Paul's opinion. That's not God's word. That's Paul's opinion. And that's a very slippery, dangerous slope because you're going to fall all the way down on that. If you take one word and you're like, that's not God's word. I don't agree with that. Where do you stop? Where do you stop? Right? So we have to stand. The only place I know where to stand on God's word and say, okay, he says it's all, all this is God breathed. And here's the good part. It's useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, right? Training and helps us to be equipped for every good work, right? And one of those good works that you can be doing is to firmly love with the truth those who are struggling, right? To love them, have some dialogue, and kind of know what God is talking about as you do that. It's not just my opinion, right? Because how many times do we have opinions and we think we are totally right and we're totally wrong? You remember you know, the Hippocratic Oath? A, a doctor, Hippocrates, back in like 486 BC, right? He's before Jesus, 500 years. He thought that what we now call germs came from bad air next to swampy places. That may be it, but that's really far off from where germs are actually coming from, right? It took a guy named Pasteur until like 1846, right? 100, 150 years ago, 60 years ago, to actually figure out what germs were. You know, the Bible was telling us in Leviticus, hey, if you touch a dead body, if you do this, you're unclean, you need to get away for seven days. I wonder what God was telling us in that. It took us thousands of years to catch up to what the Bible was teaching us, right? We can just do that over and over. Archaeology, Oh, wow, they're actually, we just uncovered, there was a dude named David. There was a city, Jericho. Oh, it sounds like Jericho. Actually, has some thick walls. I mean, archaeology, science, medicine, you name it, it always catches up to the Bible. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise in school, okay? They might, there's all these websites that'll, that'll tell you this, but you know what? Research it, research it, dig deeper, and you will find that, that the Bible is right. And it's going to show you the truth. And so here's what we start with, right? If we have something that says this is God breathed, let me start here and bring hope to those who are struggling. The next question is this. Is what the Bible teaches about human sexuality clear? Do you think it is? Let me challenge you. How many times do you ever have a topic you're like, man, I wish like God would just tell me what to do. Right? You ever have these topics where you go into the Bible, you're like, man, why can't I just look up in the index and there's exactly that thing that, that, that I'm wrestling with and God could tell me. And sometimes we think that about sexuality. We're like, well, God isn't really clear on this, you know. Jesus never said much about this. That's one I hear all the time. Jesus never said much about this, right? He did. And God did. God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit nudging you will help you to find it, right? It is clear. And here's what, what the, where the clearness comes out. It all comes down to your identity. Okay? Now let's wrestle with this. How do you know who you are? Well, I was named this, right? That's my name. Now who are you? Where do you find your identity? Is it by what you wear? Is it by who you hang out with? Is it by your job? Your bankroll? Is it what people tell you? How many people have just called you all these things since a child? Right? And you believe it. You know what? That's not from God. Because God has a very true and good identity for you. Remember God? God makes things good. And Satan counterfeits it. God made your identity 
And Satan says, no, that's not who you are, right? Let, let's see, let's see where, this, where this comes from. We're going to look in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image and our likeness so that they may rule over the fish of the sea, the birds in the sky, over the livestock, all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Do you see what he did? He said, let us make them in our image. There's two big things to that sentence, probably a thousand more. But the two big things that stand out to me are this. First of all, let us. This is the first mention, by the way, in the Bible of the Trinity. He didn't say, let me, let us. So we believe that just as John chapter 1 says is that Jesus, the Holy Spirit, were with God the Father, the Creator, as things were being created. And as you were there, God the Father spoke, and he says, hey, let us make these folks, in, and this is the second part, into our image. So what does that look like? If you're made in the image of God, some people think it you know, looks like this, the Imago Deo, right? The image of God. Some people think it looks like this, the Sistine Chapel. Uh, I don't know if you've been there, so if not, I'm going to bring it to you, right? Michelangelo has been you know, a long time just painting all the, the acts of creation right here, especially the, in the middle, the pinnacle of it is the creation of man and woman. And I love to get even closer here to look at what he shows is, is like the, the moment, the touch, right? It's where God, God connects himself with you. And scripture tells us that he breathed life into man, right? A little bit later in Genesis 2, he actually breathed his spirit into us. And so that kind of makes me wonder, when we're made in the image of God, does it necessarily mean physical? God may not look like us, but in his spirit, in the image of God, he made us before the fall in perfection. We were made in his image, in his likeness, to love, to cherish, to be of the truth, right? To know our identity, right? We are made in the image of God. But notice in this image what he's doing. There's a word in the, in the, the Hebrew called kadosh, right? Genesis uses this word over and over. And the word kadosh means to separate, right? So he kadoshed the day and the night. He separated the day and the night. He separated light from darkness. He separated the waters from the dry ground, right? He separated the flying things from the swimming things. It, you know, he separated this stuff, right? You see this over and over, so it must be important. But he also separated us to be male and female. You get this connection right here? A little bit later, look at here. It's in Matthew 19. Jesus, when they were challenging him on divorce... He says, let me kind of change the subject here, and I want to actually talk about what God meant by this design of a man and a woman, right? So this is what Jesus says. He says, haven't you read, he replied, that in the beginning, right, this is what we were just talking about in Genesis, in the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. What's Jesus doing here? He is highlighting the kadosh, right? First of all, they are separated. They are born as a man and a woman. Jesus is saying they are different. Right? He's reflecting scripture, reflecting creation that he was at. That God did make us different. We are he and she's. Right? He acknowledges that. But in the same breath, Jesus says the intention, and this isn't for all, right? Because later on he says some are celibate, they're eunuchs, right? They're celibate. Uh, they don't get married. But the, for those who do get married, God takes that kadosh, which is beautiful in and of itself. You know, we are both as a man and a woman reflecting God's glory. He brings them back together in a beautiful unity called marriage. And that's where a man and a woman can only do what a man and a woman do, and they reflect the unity of God right there, the image of God brought together in what we, he calls a one flesh union, okay? Man, the Bible has a lot to say about this gender stuff. It really does. And it's good, right? It's good. It's good. So, Paul, he takes the baton a little later in Ephesians, right? And I'm going to read this verse to you, and it's going to sound confusing to you because you're not going to know the context maybe, and so I will share that with you in a second. So here's the verse. It's Ephesians chapter 5. And Paul says, this is a profound mystery. 
But I'm talking about Christ in the church. What is the mystery? What's he talking about? So this is a favorite of uh, people getting married, right? It's Ephesians 4 and 5. talks about how wives should, you know, be with their husbands and husbands should be with their wives. And I love this part because it gives husbands twice as many verses on how you're supposed to treat your wife, right? So y'all hold this up that, hey, you got a lot of direction you need, husband, right? But here's what the husband is encouraged to do. Love, love your wife like Christ does the church. And in this section, Paul makes a connection. God's doing this through Paul. He says, just as the church is the bride of Christ, so your wife is your bride. Not that you are Jesus, right? But that you treat her like Jesus. You uplift her and you, you serve each other. The wife submits serving, serving her husband out of honor, right? All this kind of stuff that the world hates to hear. God has a beautiful design for this. And that's the unity from kadosh, separate, to actually bring in together. One little note on that kadosh, as you follow it through the, through the, the separation process through Genesis and then through the, through the Old Testament, that word starts to get a connotation of being set apart holy for God, right? So we kadosh this, we set apart this holy for God. That's what happens at your baptism. You are set apart holy for God. And then there's a time in your life, if God brings you in marriage, that you are then brought from the two to unity. Okay, I'm hoping this is helping, right? Because it's, it's a way to talk. Now, I'm just going to pause right here, back to the world. Okay, You're like, well, how do I talk to somebody who actually wants to start hormone treatments? This, right? I think what you can do is talk to them about their identity. Okay? You are feeling this, and, and I know your feeling and your struggle is real, but I want to share with you what is even more real because God is more real than our feelings. Did you get that? God is more real than our feelings. His truth is correct, more correct, if you will, than our feelings. And so even though we struggle, and our friend across the table may be struggling with this, there is a truth and a hope that God shares that say, you hang with God, and I'll, I'll help walk you through this, right? To the truth. So here's the last question. Is what the Bible says about human sexuality sufficient? Is it sufficient? I'm sure we all always wish, like, I wish this from God a lot. I wish I could actually, like, just have five minutes with God and say, hey, uh, there are some modern questions we need some, like, specific answers to right now, right? Like, our churches wrestle with these questions all the time, whether it's human sexuality, whether it's, you know, whatever topic it would be. And so I'm like, God, please give this to me. And you know how many times he's actually came and spoke to me on that? Not yet. But what he, you know, what he does, it's, it's uh, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. My grace is sufficient for you, right? And here's some of his grace. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. It says this, his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness, right? He has given us everything we need for a godly life. And it's found in his word, right? So, 1966. 1966, John Hopkins University started in the forefront of what's actually surg surgical gender reassignment procedures. Okay? They were rolling with these until until 16 or till uh, 1979 okay so this is for 13 years why did they stop in 1979 there was a doctor a doctor and his name you can look this up his name is paul McHugh. he was the head of the psychiatry department at john hopkins and he was studying all of the individuals that they actually physically were changed and what he realized was this no matter how much physical change you make in a person, in the end, they're still inside a man or a woman. And in the end, it's not the physical, but it's the emotional and the spiritual that needs help. This is from a secular doctor. He's not a, not a, a you know, this isn't a Christian study. This is from the school. And so they also found, they found that more people, percentage-wise, 
were depressed after getting the change than before. In fact, they found that more were suicidal afterwards than before. So they stopped for 38 years, and in 2017, they started up again. Why do I share that story with you? Because of this. The Bible could have told us this in 1966, but it took until 1979 for the scientists, the psychiatrists, to understand, you know what? This isn't good for people. It's not helping like we thought. You know that happens all the time? where society, groups, institutions will say, this is good for somebody. This is the truth, right? And we know this is right because science has told us so or whatever has told us so. This is what's going to tell us what's right. It has given us everything we need for a life after God's heart, right? That's what that scripture paraphrasing it says. Everything you need is in here. And so I'm going to end this series on this question to wrestle with whether it's gender dysphoria, gender identity, whatever the topic is for you, is there anything that you wrestle with that you're like, you know what? I think I know better than God. My feelings tell me this. My friends tell me this. Or maybe the news tells me this, right? Whatever news spectrum you're on, crazy stuff. Just let yourself, don't don't let this series just sit up on the shelf but say, you know what? God has the truth and eventually we find the truth but it's always in here. And so when you get challenged and you're wrestling with this, go to God's word. Say, God, please show me your true north. Amen.